Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Intelligence Squared. I'm senior producer Connor Boyle, and today we're going to show you some of episode seven of our new podcast series, After Putin. It's where we look at what's been going on in Russia since the Wagner mutiny a couple of weeks ago, and we ask whether the Putin regime is getting stronger, has survived, or is getting weaker and could possibly collapse in the months or years to come. Today's episode features Dr. Yu Jia. She's a senior fellow on China at the Asia Pacific Programme at Chatham House. And we're also joined by Professor Michael Cox, also an associate fellow at Chatham House and Emeritus Professor of International Relations at LSE and author of lots of books, including The Post-Cold War World. If you do enjoy it, please do subscribe to the full series. It's all in audio and features some great guests like Bill Browder, Anne Applebaum, Mikhail Zegar, and much, much more. We hope you enjoy it. But now let's go to today's episode on the relationship between China and Russia and Xi and Putin's limitless friendship. So, Jia, if I can start with you, we've all been seeing this sort of warmer relationship between China and Russia in the last few years. Is this a recent phenomenon or have these countries been allies for for a longer time? Well, delighted to join Intelligence Square debate this time. Uh, I think on this re- uh, on this regard, I think it's less so something a new phenomenon, but I think it's a long running relationship, well dated back to I think date back to 18th century between the late Qing Dynasty and the Imperial Russia. But I think what really gives the recent flavor is how much irritants this bilateral relationship between. China and Russia now in the past between the Chinese Communist Party and the Soviet Union. So I think what we have now is that renewed warm relationship, particularly under President Xi Jinping since he came to power. So that really make the rest of the world wonder what is going on on this so-called the coordination, if you may call it, of course, or alignment between Beijing and the Moscow. So I think it's not really something recent phenomenon. Every successive Chinese leaders since 1949 try to cultivate some kind of warm relationship with Russia or with the Soviet Union. But particularly under President Xi Jinping, that has been really well established and flourished, I would say. And, and Michael, you know, you know the Soviet Union. How different is the relationship now between the countries than it was maybe in the past? Is this sort of based on a mutual is it always been based on a kind of a mutual dislike of the United States or, or is there something deeper between the between the two countries? I, I think it's something deeper, but it's also based on a, a antagonism to the United States, US led world order. And going back to what uh, my colleague from Chatham House said, I think I'm absolutely in agreement with that. This is a long term relationship. The relationship between the Chinese Communist Party, the Soviet Union is absolutely fundamental, even though Putin is not a communist, nonetheless, he is an inheritor of the Soviet Union. There was a very close relationship in the 1950s, and then there was war between them. And what we've seen since the 1980s onwards, and beginning with Gorbachev and Deng Xiaoping, was a rapprochement, mending of fences, little by little in the 80s, then more rapidly in the 1990s, they, ser- they signed their first treaty of friendship and neighborliness in 2001. So this even precedes uh, Putin and, and, and President Xi. Of course, they have taken it to a new level, and at that new level, we're now watching, operating, and working out through the Ukraine war. I also make one final point, Connor, and I don't want to overreach, overreach the point. I think what it was, there's two things you've got to remember. One, borders. We've always had long discussions about this, haven't we, Sherry? You've got to get the border right. This is a over 4,000 kilometer border, and this was the most militarized border in the world for nearly 20 years and simply settling the border question is really quite fundamental to their bilateral relationship and that also in some ways precedes uh, the more antagonistic relationship both of them have to and with each other uh, against the united states but never leave out the border this is such an important part which gives a, a, a base to this relationship which is often left out of the more popular discussion i think just to adding a reference for that regarding the length of border, I think Mick mentioned a number of over 4,000 kilometers. I mean, think about it. It's really equivalent the width of Europe as a continent. So if China or Beijing cannot handle Russia very well regarding the border issue, then Russia will almost certainly become a source 
of disruption and the threat of Beijing's national security. Mm. So I think that really because of the border issue, taking such an important position on this bilateral relationship. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and Mick, can I just ask you this mm. point? Speaking about that border, do you think that plays a role in terms of uh, Xi's support of Putin? Is there a worry that um, maybe a post-Putin Russia or instability in Russia uh, would have impacts on the Chinese border, or is or, well, the, uh, well, it's a very good question, and the answer is we we what we do know is what Xi wants in Russia is stability, order, <laughs> the same kind of thing he wants in China itself, and to have an orderly, stable Russia is absolutely a quintessential part of Chinese national interest. Now we've seen a lot of instability or a threat to that stability in order with the whole crisis created by the Wagner thing. But very interestingly, and I'd be interested to hear what my colleague says, you know, it's very interesting to see how Beijing ran in very quickly behind behind Putin. You know, he is their man in Russia. It isn't going to be Prashogin. It's not going to be anybody else. And I, I think actually in some ways that re- that relation was, was tested through that crisis. And I think it might indeed have come out the other end, although there's a little bit of wobble there, maybe even stronger than before, because after Putin, who will it be? You know, and there is really from the Chinese perspective, I don't think very much alternative to, to who they now have in the Kremlin. And his name is Vladimir Putin. And, and, and Gia, on that point, because obviously China's relationship with Russia has to be balanced uh, on its relationships with other other countries and blocs. How do you think China have have sought to balance that relationship between Europe specifically and Russia uh, over the last year or two with the war in Ukraine? Can they balance both and keep both happy? Um, Obviously, as uh, Mick mentioned earlier on this um, likely military um, intervention what happened over two weeks ago, and China have really reconsidered its own choice on uh, Russia's um, invasion towards Ukraine, whether China has really considered its alignment with Russia as a sense of offset, or now seems to be more likely as being a sense of liability towards Beijing's diplomacy, particularly towards Europe, because overall this invasion happened in the Eurasia continent, and that matter massively among European countries. And given the current geopolitical climate between Beijing and Washington, that sense of great power competition, and what Beijing would be really interested in so far, it is really to driving a wedge between Europe and the United States, and particularly by using China's economic statecraft through trade and through renewed investment and hoping that European companies can maintain within China. So that is always in Beijing's great interest. However, I think the difficulties for the European is, unless Beijing would fundamentally shifting its position regarding Russia and Russia's invasion towards Ukraine, I think what we're talking about to warm up the tie between China and Europe still remain as some, something to do with more a positive noise unless so something substantive would happen. Now, come back to the internal stability issue um, in Russia and then how Beijing view this. I think the immediate concern, by the way, myself, I'm not a, a I'm not a particular military Wagner specialist, but a music Wagner specialist in here. Um, The matter in here for Beijing is firstly the immediate border dispute that might happen given the instability inside Russia and given the amount of influx of refugees and Russian citizens may cross the border. So that creates a sense of immediate instability. Now, I think the medium term worry is that Beijing obviously considered this alignment and invested heavily on Putin's staying power. And what Beijing cannot know at this stage is who will be the successor of the Vladimir. And hence, Beijing is not able to make any comments regarding Russia's internal affairs. It is not because just the standard line Beijing by saying does not want to interfere domestic affairs of another country. It's because Beijing is deeply worried if in case any other faction beyond Putin came to power, and if Beijing made unsolicited comments regarding other political forces, and that would really lead into some kind of embarrassing situation for Beijing and for Xi Jinping itself. So I think Beijing is watching this very closely, now reconsider whether its alignment with Russia would be something really worthwhile. 
And Michael, if I come to you, we've seen mm. the Financial Times report that Xi warned Putin not to use nuclear weapons. Mm. Uh, is that the red flag, which is the only thing that could, you know, cause a schism in the China-Russia relationship? Well, as, as you know, uh, earlier this year, and it's continuing, of course, China has put forward a series of peace proposals uh, about which a lot of people in the West have been fairly sceptical. Nonetheless, they have put forward peace proposals. And I think some some people in the West are a bit too sceptical about those peace proposals because I think it clearly indicates uh, that they simply don't want this war to continue because, as Cherry said, it creates problems for China. It creates, firstly, problems in terms of its international image, not in the whole world, because some parts of the world actually have a very positive view of Russia and a very positive view of China, but certainly Europe and European Union doesn't have a very positive view of China insofar as China has been seen to be a close supporter, if not a close ally of Russia in this war. And this has turned public opinion in Europe, uh, I wouldn't say 100 degrees, but it's certainly turned it in, in a direction which China cannot be at all comfortable with. Moreover, it has increased the economic pressures on people like van der Leyen and others in Europe to say, well, what about not de-linking completely but de-risking and that would mean therefore falling in with the americans on a whole question of economic relations and again china cannot like that so the liability side of it grows as long as the war continues and i agree entirely with jerry the only thing i'd add and i'm not sure there's disagreement between us on this i think asset is a problematic term but nonetheless we've got to really ask, ask the question and answer it why is it that through this long long bloody war uh, China has remained on side more or less, or Xi Jinping has remained on side more or less through all this since February of, of, of 2022. When anybody in the West starts saying, ah, oh, they're beginning to move apart, there's a beginning of embarrassment, we hear different noises coming out of Beijing. I've, I've been speaking to some public intellectuals in Beijing. <laughs> they tell me they don't like this war. Then what happens? Zhongnan Hai, the leadership in Beijing, comes down yet again, you know, 40 plus meetings between the two leaders. We've seen recent meetings between senior officials from both sides going back and forth. We've seen the military cooperation continuing, the economic ties deepening. You know, so th this I think is a long term relationship. And I think China's problem is how it manages to maintain this relationship, yet at the same time try to bring this war to, to, to a speedy conclusion. That's going to be a huge problem because, as we can see, Connor. And nobody actually at the moment really wants to bring this war to an end. Russia doesn't want to. Ukraine believes it can start to win this war possibly over the next few months. And of course, the United States itself and the Europeans supporting the United States for the moment will continue to back Ukraine in terms of its longer term goal of reclaiming the sovereign top soil of Ukraine. So we're in a very long term situation. However much China wants to push the peace process, I'm not sure it's going to go very far. And therein lies the problem.